Splint Studio can help you design and create a full coverage anterior deprogramming splint. In this video, we'll show you the workflow for such a splint type. On the order form in Dental Desktop, select any tooth in the upper jaw in the overview window, and then Appliance, and then Splint. Remember to choose In-house to do the production in your lab. Next, proceed with scanning or import the scans. Move further when done. Firstly, from the drop-down menu, you can also select which machine and material you want to produce your splint with. The machine selection will apply the manufacturer's recommended manufacturing values for the machine and material combination. Now, define the occlusal plane by placing three points on the scan, following the prompts that appear in the Hints window. This will make sure that the model will be placed correctly in the virtual articulator. Use the control points to adjust the plane until you are satisfied. To make sure that the occlusal plane has been set correctly, Making the antagonist visible and examining from the lingual view may help. Please note that in cases where the first molars are missing, as reference points, you may use other available teeth to mimic the corresponding position and further adjust the plane to correct the placement. Move further when done. At the bite configuration step, make sure that the jaws are correctly positioned in the articulator by using the control points. To help you to do this, there are a few useful tools. Using the interocclusal clearance tool to open the bite will ensure that the given value in millimeters is the minimum one in static occlusion. Bear in mind that in a full coverage anterior deprogrammer, the interocclusal clearance must accommodate the minimum thickness of the splint material. Therefore, the minimum vertical opening to disclude all teeth may be more than found in jigs or anterior bite blocks. The teeth outlines on the default plane can help you adjust position by aligning the model with the outlines. The tilt and height position of the jaws can be adjusted by using the control points. By left-clicking on either jaw, you can activate it and change its position individually. Note that changing the jaw relations should be done extremely carefully. When satisfied, Use the Lock Jaw Position tool to lock the jaws in position. Clicking the 2D cross-section tool will allow you to check if interocclusal clearance is sufficient for the splint. To do this, look at the model from the top and draw a line so that you can see both sides of the dentition in the cross-section panel. Use the control points to move or rotate the plane if needed. Now, find the narrowest point of the cross-section and take a measurement to check it. Then run articulation. As the jaws are moving, it may turn out that the bite may not be opened enough to accommodate for the minimum thickness required. If you need to make any changes, unlock the jaw position tool, apply new values, once again lock the jaw position, run the articulation, Check again with the cross-section tool before moving on. In this step, the insertion direction is proposed automatically by the software. If you would like to change it, rotate the model as if looking at the scan from the direction that the splint would be put on the jaw. Press the From View button, and this new insertion direction will be calculated. The insertion direction can also affect the possible retentiveness of the splint. By adjusting the direction, you can control the location and volume of the undercut areas. If a notification saying that the model has tunnels or holes appears, it is advisable to press Correct, as this ensures that further design steps are not hindered by possible problems on the surface of the scan. You can now adjust the retentiveness of the splint. All the colored areas are undercuts. When the Perform Undercuts Removal option is enabled, it will block the splint from going into an undercut area. If you disable this option, the undercuts will still be shown, but the splint will not be automatically blocked from going into those areas. 
By changing the retention value, you can decide how much the occlusal splint is allowed to go into an undercut area. In the wax trimming step, you can apply wax to protect potentially sensitive areas in the patient's mouth from direct contact with the splint's inner surface, as contact may cause discomfort or irritation to the patient. For example, the ruga, papilla incisiva, incisal edges, and the gum line. Wax can also be applied to block out and safeguard fixed retainers, tooth jewelry, and fragile structures. Blockout wax should also be applied on surfaces with missing scan data, for example holes or scan artifacts. Note that you can use the smooth tool by left clicking the mouse button and smoothing any areas. The smooth tool allows for the adding of relief wax in a controlled way, using the surface normals of the scan. For a stronger effect, the Add tool can be applied in a desired strength and diameter. You can also use the Add and Smooth tools to apply extra wax relief into sharp fissures and interproximal areas to significantly facilitate the seating of the splint. In this step, you can also add retention locally. For example, retention can be acquired from undercut areas from both the buccal and palatal sides of the patient's teeth. This can be done bilaterally, for example, from the canines, the first premolars, or first molars. Use the Remove tool to remove some blockout wax in those areas. The color scale informs you how much depth the local retention area has. When satisfied, press Next to go further. Now it is time to draw the splint outline. You can add points or hold down the left mouse button and draw a line. You can start your outline in various places, for example, starting from the last molar. The outline needs to be completed by connecting the last point to the starting point of the spline. Please note that in cases where you chose to acquire retention locally, it is crucial to draw the outline through the desired retention areas. You can edit the spline at any time. In the case presented here, the outline is drawn following the prominence line over the local retention areas. The incisal edges are covered with approximately 1 to 1.5 millimeters of material, and on the palate, the outline is scalloped following the gingival margin at a 0.5 to 1 millimeter distance. Behind the maxillary incisors, the distance is slightly increased. Now you can also adjust the splint thickness and set the minimum thickness. The latter will ensure that the minimum thickness value is enforced wherever it is not possible to maintain the general thickness value. The software notifies you in case of minimum thickness violations. Minimum thickness will depend on the specific machine manufacturing process selected. The offset from teeth to splint directly affects the fitting of the splint. We recommend it to be more than zero millimeters. The drill diameter is set when using a milling machine instead of a 3D printer. When you are satisfied with placement of the outline, move on to further steps. In the raised surface step, you can create surfaces that will form the outer geometry of the occlusal splint. When designing an anterior deprogrammer type splint with contacts only on the anterior areas and no guidance requirements, a good tool to start with is the raised to antagonist plane. The tool can be used by dragging the cursor over the desired teeth areas. The values shown here were used to create a bite block with well-defined edges. The raised to antagonist plane allows the use of a plane perpendicular to the occlusal plane to form the bite block surface. The plane height should be adjusted to just be in contact or only slightly overlap the tips of the lower incisors. Use the control points to adjust the position of the plane. In this case, the raised block ranges roughly from central incisor to central incisor. 
the raised bite block can also cover a bigger area, such as that from lateral incisor to lateral incisor. Please note that, alternatively, you can choose to use the Raised to Antagonist Cusp Tips tool to create the anterior bite block. This will result in a flat plane with close contacts to the occluding teeth, with the following design step being the same. However, the plane of the block will not be perpendicular to the occlusal plane. In the example case, we'll leave non-occluding areas unselected, which will result in a generic offset from the scan surface in the previously defined splint thickness. When satisfied with the design, move further on. In the Adapt Design step, pop-up notifications may appear during the various stages of design adaptation. You can always choose to let the software make corrections automatically, or you can do it by yourself and press Accept. By enabling the distance map, you can see the distance of the antagonist from the splint surface. The Smooth or Remove tool will help remove material in all areas that are not needed nor relevant for a given splint type. In the Deprogrammer case, with generic offset having been used to cover most surfaces, you can see the splint geometry seems bumpy or irregular. A weak Add and Smooth tool with a large diameter will help smoothen some of these surfaces in an effective way, without reducing the material strength. This will result in a geometry that is easier to polish and facilitates hygiene maintenance. To start refining the contact pattern on the surface of the bite block, the articulator needs to be set up by disabling the Guide by Incisal pin and also enabling Guide by Design. You will see the initial static contacts appearing in the form of red collision lines. The distance map only shows proximity, not contacts. If all the occluding teeth do not produce collision marks, collision marks can be produced by gently adding material on the expected contact areas until the desired static contacts are achieved. Now run articulation by pressing the green play icon. It is advisable to make the antagonist visible. Depending on the occluding teeth chosen, you may check that there are no contacts emerging from the canines in lateral otrusion and mediotrusion. Lateral otrusion and mediotrusion contacts are shown as green and blue, and retrusion and protrusion are black. Also, depending on the occluding teeth chosen, the central incisors in this case, you may want to sculpt away any involvement from lateral incisors in protrusive movements. Rerun articulation to check the effect of any sculpting done. You can now fine-tune protrusive contacts by locking lateral otrusion and mediotrusion and running articulation. To establish even protrusive contacts from all occluding teeth, you may have to add material and rerun the articulation multiple times. Generally, adding material gently on the desired areas and running the articulation immediately after will result in a controlled outcome. You may need to add some wax to the outer rim of the bite block to have enough material to antagonize the incisors in maximum protrusion. You can manually use the protrusion slider to evaluate the need for further support. Also note that in cases where you have more than two lower incisors occluding on the bite plane, that if a lower incisor incisal edge is significantly below the occlusal plane, you may consider excluding it from the protrusive pattern. Possible posterior contacts forming on the surface of the deprogrammer need to be evaluated and removed. If you find posterior collisions, you can choose to remove material locally and rerun articulation to check if the collision has been removed. If the material removal results in a violation of the minimum thickness value, you can choose to automatically correct or accept the violation. You can also return to the bite configuration step to increase the interocclusal distance. Alternatively, you can choose to leave a local minimum thickness violation if, in your opinion, the violation is not critical. 
Sometimes you may notice that a posterior collision may result from the maximum extension of the protrusive movement, sliding the jaw over the bite block. You may then consider if the maximum protrusion applies to the case at hand. It is worth remembering that it is a process of adding, removing and smoothing, along with running articulation to assess the impact that will help you with adapting the design to your desired outcome. To check the final outcome, to check if the splint is going to work in the intended way, you can toggle the guide by design button on. Now the movements will be guided by the splint's geometry. Then run all movements guided by design and observe that the desired contact pattern is drawn on the surface of the bite block. When you're satisfied with the outcome, press Next. At the production preparation step, it is possible to put an ID tag on the splint. For cases intended for long-term use, consider whether the tag should be engraved, as that could create a plaque retentive surface. When you're satisfied with the outcome, press Next. Finally, the design splint STL file should be saved to a designated output folder for production. You have now learned how to create a full coverage anterior deprogramming splint.